Good morning. Good morning. Look at this wonderful 9 a.m. group of classes. Thank you so much for coming. Bravo to all of you. And welcome to our symposium on global perspectives on race and racism, generously funded by a grant from the Mellon Foundation. We have been trying to do this symposium since before COVID. We've had this in our plans. The Mellon Foundation has been a great partner with Trinity and was very interested first in helping us to develop our global affairs program and then in seeing Trinity's great work in racial equity and social equity be promoted to the world and to let people know what we're doing here. And I am just so pleased that this symposium has come together so beautifully. I wanna take this opportunity first to thank Dr. Alan Pietrabon for organizing. Alan, thank you so much. He's done heroic work on this. And thank you, Dr. Kimberly Monroe. I know you have a big piece of this. And I know Dr. Aaron Carrier has been part of our global affairs group. Thank you, Aaron. I don't know, there's Dr. Josh Wright. Dr. Josh Wright has played a big role. And, and tonight we're gonna hear Dr. Wright talk about Kanye West. So don't miss that part of the program. I can't wait. I've been reading your book, Josh, and let, I've got lots of questions. So. <laughs> and I'm so pleased to see fresh from sabbatical, Dr. James Stoker has come in from sabbatical to join us today. And James was our first director of the Global Affairs Program and we're so grateful to him for all he did. Um, I would also be remiss if I did not recognize and thank all of the tremendous support staff who are here today. Um, there's Phil over there running the video. <laughs> uh, there's um, Timothy taking the pictures. I know Christine Salvador and Kathalon Tolliver did all of the heavy lifting for all the arranging. I want to thank you all. Um, I'm so pleased, uh, uh, Nicole Andal, for joining us today, and Alan will introduce you in a moment. And we are very, very pleased to have such a wonderful partnership with the Center for Strategic and International Studies. I'm sure that some of the fellows are here today who have worked with you, and it's just great. So I can't wait to hear the program. I'm not going to talk anymore because I want the program to get going. And it gives me great pleasure. And please welcome Dr. Alan Pietrabon. Thank you. Thank you, President McGuire, for that generous introduction. And I thought the best way to kick off this event is to take just three minutes to tell you a brief story about a man named Norman Cousins, who for 35 years was the editor of the prominent American magazine, Saturday Review. And in his capacity as a journalist, Cousins, whenever he interviewed an international diplomat or a prominent politician, he would ask them one simple question. In your lifetime, what have you learned? And when you put that question to President John F. Kennedy, the president thought about it for a moment and replied, you can always tell the real value of an advisor, not by the answers he gives you, but by the questions you haven't thought of yourself yet. President Eisenhower, when asked that question, responded that the rules of good global leadership are really quite simple, but it's applying those rules justly that is so confoundingly complicated. But it was really the one I liked the most, the famed humanitarian Albert Schweitzer, who was working in Africa. When asked by Cousins what he had learned, he responded, I think if you have something to do that's important in the world, don't expect people to roll stones out of your way for you. But regardless of what you do, you should make your life your argument. And of all those quotes for us here at Trinity, I think make your life your argument is a sentiment we strive for. Because all of you students in the room will spend many years pouring through your education here, pushing the boundaries of thought, expanding your intellect. You'll learn to discuss ideas and challenge notions and see things through different global perspectives. 
And then as Trinity graduates, you're gonna go out and you will pursue leadership positions yourself where it will then be up to you to model and foster what you've learned here. But the really difficult part is that all around us, all around the world right now, we see endless examples of violence and, and hate and fear and racism and right now a chilling example of war, which makes it really easy to despair at all of these overwhelming problems that we face as both a country and as a world. But here again, Norman Cousins can teach us something because he also lived in a time of violence and fear and war. He grew up through the Great Depression. He lived through World War II. He witnessed the Holocaust. He was Jewish. But instead of being dragged down by the cynics, by those uh, cynics in his own dark times, he maintained his optimism. He continued to advocate for a better, more peaceful world. And that's why he asked that question. That's why he asked the greatest minds of his generation what they had learned, what wisdom they had to share with the world. So we are really excited here in Global Affairs that through the generous foundation, or funding of the Mellon Foundation, we're able to bring you this symposium, where we've been able to bring together some of the great minds of our time and our generation. We've, uh, and they're going to share with us what they've learned. Our speakers over the next two days, some of whom we'll hear from, have graduated from this very institution and gone off around the world in these leadership positions. They're going to share with us their wisdom, their global perspectives about what they've learned looking at these topics of race and racism from all parts of the world. So we are so glad you're here joining us, both our students and our staff and our faculty and everyone who's helped um, and our wonderful speakers. So first, Thank you all for coming. I need to thank you here. But it is my great pleasure to introduce our first speaker for the night, for the night, Ooh, long day, for the morning. Um, our first speaker where, um, uh, is joining us from the uh, Center for Strategic and International Studies. Uh, we are going to welcome Nicole Andal, who is the Senior Vice President for People and Culture, where she served as a leader on diversity and inclusion throughout her long um, uh, international affairs and legal career. The People and Culture Initiative at CSIS is dedicated to elevating diverse voices and perspectives to lead to more ideas, more innovation, more robust policy solutions. And I hope I'm not, over, not overstepping. She is also writing a Cold War spy novel um, that brings in these questions of race and racism in the 1960s through the lens of Cold War spies, which I think is really cool. So without further ado, Nicole, thank you for joining us today. <laughs> Good morning. Thank you, Alan, Dr. Pietrabon. President McGuire, thank you so much for having me this morning. Um, Dr. Stoker, I don't, where you, I see you, thank you for being here as well. Um, and if there are any CSIS fellows in the house, please put your hands up. Anyone's here, I'm so happy to see you. Let's give them a big round of applause. So I was exceptionally pleased to be asked to come here and speak to you today. I got a little um, turned around. I have not been back on campus in 20 years, though I did not go to school here. I do have family members that graduated from Trinity Washington. So I'm really pleased to be here this morning. And I will say that, you know, through our mission at the Center for Strategic and International Studies as a you know, prominent think tank in the international affairs space, it is with great humility that we approach this issue on diversity, recognizing that it continues to be a topic that hasn't quite frankly come to where it should be at this point. Um, we've been talking about this for a long time. So I'm not here to belabor the problem. I'm here to talk through how I navigated my career and also where I see this conversation going from a direction of talking about the problem to doing something about it. And I do read from paper. Uh, so like uh, President Biden, I do have a stutter, which you would not know because after years of practice and going to law school and moot court, something I've been working on. So if I look down at my paper from time to time, I apologize. <laughs> 
Uh, let me start by saying that I am a graduate of Howard University, so I did, you know, in initially go that direction. I'm a third generation HBCU graduate, um, and I'm very proud to speak to that, as well as uh, many members of my family attending women's colleges as well. And I really appreciate the opportunity to learn in that environment. It really did help shape who I am as a professional. Um, I was a Russian studies major at Howard University, and this was back in 1990 when, you know, the Soviet Union was kind of in its last days and Russian studies was a hot topic in the DC area, but not so much on my campus. And so, you know, I, I walked into that educational experience with a really open mind, but definitely through the lens of being an African American woman. And what was really interesting is that you would perceive I was walking into space and kind of forging a path that had not yet been walked, which is not true. Um, every time somebody looked at me and said, why are you studying Russian? I could point to Secretary Condoleezza Rice as an example. And that's where I get to the issue of representation and how much it matters. So when I, you know, when I graduated with this degree in Russian studies back in 1995, I expected to easily walk into a foreign affairs career, but it proved a lot harder for me than for my colleagues coming from other schools like Georgetown and American because that lack of brand recognition in the international affairs space for Howard, right? So I had to do a lot more to kind of build my credentials in the space. I self funded a study abroad in the form of doing an au pair program, which is a homestay as opposed to going into a university and being around other international students. Um, you know, I also couldn't afford an unpaid internship. As we know, a lot of these organizations, the State Department still does not pay their interns. We do, by the, by the way. Uh, and so I, you know, had to almost burn myself out working a full-time job while you know, doing the type of internship that I wanted to do. And then, you know, I started to kind of buy in because I, I felt like I was hitting all these roadblocks and I started to buy into the trope that I needed like more experience for jobs. But then I saw inexperienced students from other schools getting those jobs. And I realized where the disconnection was, it was the lack of connections, right? I mean, this is Washington, DC who you know matters, getting into those spaces matters. So, you know, that was my first, I would say, foray into directly addressing the problem of diversity in international affairs. It's not that there aren't diverse voices in international affairs, it's just that access to those spaces where those diverse voices can be heard is the problem. So I'm gonna back up again. I'm gonna kind of use my career as a, you know, a, a roadmap through how I started to navigate these issues. So when I started my career, at the, I went to the Department of Energy um, and I was a foreign affairs specialist there. So it's a, you know, a, kind of like an entry GS-11 professional role for somebody who wants to work in foreign policy. It is not a diplomat role. So it's not foreign service. There are other avenues to to foreign um, affairs work in the government that is not the foreign service. And, you know, it wasn't, so it, it wasn't a surprise to me at that point that I just saw very few faces of color. I didn't see any amongst my peers. I didn't see any in my supervisors. And I saw a few women here and there, but not, not very many. I mean, there were, there were, there were folks here and there, but you know, not so much in the space where I was working, which was the non-proliferation space. Um, there were more women and folks of color in like USAID, some parts of the State Department, um, but we seemed to be kind of spread around, right? You know, but it was kind of interesting. Um, I did a semester of law school in Ukraine and, um, you know, as, as Alan pointed out, I'm writing a book about the experience of race and intersectionality in the Soviet Union. Um, and it, it, it felt like all of those of us of color in that space found each other. You know, you could just basically stand out by a fountain and wait 15 minutes and then one black person would find you and then 
they would tell their friend and then another one would come and then they would tell their friend and another one would come. And so my experience in national security was quite a bit like that. You would find yourself in the space, you would go to a meeting, you would find somebody else like you, and then you would create those connections. Now, again, that's to say there is diversity in our profession, but we do tend to be a little you know, spread out, which is why I kind of recast the discussion on diversity from there being a lack of diversity to being a lack of acknowledgement of the diversity in international affairs. Because here we are 70 years after you know, Ralph Bunch got a Nobel Peace Prize for negotiating a ceasefire between Israelis and Palestinians. This was 70 years ago. We're still talking about how to increase diversity in international affairs. All right, so the barriers to entry were there, but some of us got through. Now we could just relax and get to work. We found a few of us. It's all good, right? Well, diversity is one thing, but inclusion is an entirely different issue. Now, here's something that happened early in my career that could have derailed my ambition, but I decided to take a step back and look at it a little differently. So it was my first meeting with foreign partners. And let me just back up. So one of my earlier jobs as a foreign affairs specialist was to work on nonproliferation, specifically nuclear nonproliferation in the former Soviet Union. And so my work took me to areas of Eastern Europe, like Azerbaijan, Armenia, Ukraine again, Poland, to work with international partners. The perception was that interacting with those people would be problematic because from the, through the lens of my American supervisors, they thought because I was different, they would not be receptive, okay? That turned out exactly the opposite because it gave the foreign partner an opportunity to interact with an American that was more representative of who we are as a country, rather than who we kept sending, right, to have these conversations. It was a real eye-opening experience for my boss to see that level of interaction. Um, but I'm gonna go back to this other situation. So I had my first meeting with foreign partners. I was one of a few junior staffers who were part of this US team. And when we got to the room, the senior members of our team went out of their way to encourage all of the junior staff to sit at the table, right? So I was one of several junior staff who'd been working on this issue. And so I felt that meant me. So I took the cue and started to put my notebook down on an open seat when one of those same senior staffers told me to sit along the wall. Now, do I need to point out that I was the only person of color in the room? But I will say that the foreign partner was a country of color and they noticed. <laughs> so I share this story for a couple of reasons. If we're gonna talk about recruitment, right? In the international policy space, we have to talk about retention. Second, what impact could I have made on the difficult negotiations just by being at the table? You know, I had a great idea midway through the meeting but I couldn't even share it with the junior staff who were passing notes to the bosses and passing notes amongst each other. And again, it wasn't until the end of the meeting where the foreign partner came over and said, well, we wanna hear what she has to say, okay? Ralph Bunch affected a foreign policy and international relations breakthrough when he was, just because he was given a seat at the table. Um, when I left government and I went to aerospace and defense industry, I was literally blown away by the number of professionals of color at all levels at my new company. So this is going from government to industry. There were senior managers, subject matter experts, mid-level managers, even division presidents of color and women CEOs. I'm not trying to imply that the numbers were high or that everything was perfect, but I was no longer the only person in the room. And HBCU grads and women's college grads were everywhere. So what gives, what is corporate America doing that in that foreign policy and international affairs community seems to be struggling with? Well, in my opinion, it is because industry understands that diversity and inclusion is good for America. 
but is equally good for business. Think about the most profitable and most respected companies. What makes them so great? They're agile, they adapt, they innovate. They don't try to improve on a winning concept, but they also don't rest on their laurels. Because they know there are sharks out there, and if they don't keep their customers happy, they will be dead in the water. Organizations are better when they have a broad range of perspectives involved in making decisions. They stay relevant and they make a lot more money. Now think about it. Think about every foreign policy decision that has been made in the past 30 years. Wars, international assistance, international diplomacy, peacekeeping. Does it seem like there's a foreign policy formula that prompts every plan? Well, let me tell you, as someone who's been in the room when decisions are made, it matters who is making the decision and it matters even more who they will listen to. As our world becomes increasingly more complex and global leadership becomes more diverse, the US had better take a look at why it is after all these years, we still have not been able to substantially and sustainably build and maintain a diverse workforce in international affairs. We need agility, we need to be adaptable, and we need to innovate. And I do not need to tell you that the problem does not lie with a diverse hire. It is not our job to fix the diversity problem, okay? You know, we come and go, but we aren't magical. Ask Ruby Bridges if she was able to change the culture of her elementary school. Now, for the purpose of this discussion, I'm gonna pay on, I'm gonna to touch a little bit on kind of corporate culture and work-life balance, because those are part of the discussion. But my point is that when you are purposeful and deliberate about diversity and inclusion, you'll become no more, a more diverse and inclusive organization. So profitable companies got very deliberate about grabbing as much diverse talent as they could get their hands on. They didn't care what school you went to or where you were from. If you proved yourself, you could be promoted. They were deliberate in their efforts. And universities that embrace corporate outreach and facilitate connections between students and corporate employers find that their students move on a little faster. That's why I could find so many compatriots in my corporate jobs. So it's time to get deliberate in the foreign policy space. We have these changes in government now. We have diverse representation at the highest levels of um, the State Department, DOD, the White House. What's happening in the middle? What's happening at the entry level? I mean, we're gonna keep seeing an increase in more diverse leadership and a return to public service for those civil servants that left the last six years. But at the same time, institutes of higher learning and the international and public policy spheres are launching ambitious initiatives, offering the best and the brightest from the ranks for internships, such as at the Center for Strategic and International Studies and entry-level hires. So I'm, going to, I'm still posing a challenge to the community to walk the walk. The international affairs community and colleges and universities are uniquely poised, poised to work together to change the trajectory so that our foreign policy and international engagements are agile, adaptable, and innovative. We will turn that corner when we are all invested. Thank you. And it may not seem that way, but I am an attorney, but I don't like to talk at people. Um, I did appellate moot court, which means I'd much rather have a conversation and I love being asked really hard questions. So I'm ready. <laughs> Anyone feel free to come up to one of the side microphones here and ask a question. Maybe I'll kick things off. We have some Zoom attendees who have asked questions. So one is thinking of being a teacher. Um, after she graduates and wonders if you have any advice for how to inspire a younger generation, even than the college level. And that's a great question. I, I'm from a family of teachers, so I speak very highly of their ability to influence their students. I think um, exposure is really the biggest uh, way to get students involved and interested in international affairs. Um, we are in such a uniquely diverse environment right now in our elementary schools and junior high schools. We have, especially in the DC area, such a rich you know, mosaic of peoples that have come to live here. My son's best friends, one is Yemeni American, the other one's um, Moroccan American. 
And, you know, having those conversations about what people bring to the table with your students, I think would be particularly impactful. Um, you know, I grew up in, you know, New York in the 70s and 80s where it was expected you would come to America and then just like kind of cast off your culture and just adopt, adapt and assimilate. And now if teachers can kind of move away from that model and instead encourage their students to share what makes them unique and share their differences, um, I think that would make foreign affairs and international policy more relevant to today's students. mentors along the way. I know you mentioned Condoleezza Rice, but, you know, given the fact that oftentimes you were the only woman of color in those spaces, you know, who were the ones who really kind of invested in you? That is such a great question. I have never met Dr. Rice. I am still trying to meet Dr. Rice. Um, just to say thank you to her for being that inspiration to me. My actual mentors, it's really interesting. The lack of diversity in leadership does not mean that there are not mentors there, okay? I think probably earlier in my career, I thought very strongly that I needed my mentor to be a woman of color or minimum a woman or minimum a person of color. And what I found was that though I was able to find mentors embodied like that over the course of my careers, my most um, impactful mentors with whom I still have a mentor mentee relationship are older white men. I mean, again, it was not, I had to really, first of all, I think as women, we tend to think somebody's offering us, they're interested or offering help because they're interested. And that is not always the case. I had to kind of step away from that idea. Um, and then it also meant I had to be confident in my skills and my job performance to know why I would have been noticed to, and pointed out for promotion. But in terms of navigating organizational culture, in terms of what types of jobs I should pursue, if I ever had an ethical dilemma at work and I needed to kind of talk it through, um, the, the two mentors that I call most frequently um, are two older white men who have risen to pretty high levels in government and industry. And they have in turn been very instrumental to helping me in my career. But in terms of, you know, seeking community and navigating those issues that are specific to me as a woman of color, that has happened time over time, and it's been mostly peers as opposed to older women. And I think it's because the, the cultural and social lens that we grew up with was different than that of uh, an older generation. And so, um, you know, again, like my mom's generation, they had to kind of put their heads down and work and kind of put up with it. You know, us Gen Xers, not so much. So I think it was just a matter of finding that community of peers because you can have peer mentorship and you can have someone who's older than you mentorship. I now also have a 22 year old mentor because of my job. I work with junior staff and younger people a lot and I need help in learning how to connect. So having that younger mentor and it's a mutually mentoring relationship, right? Where I can do some mentorship but I get a lot more um, out of it, I admit has also been very helpful. So all that's to say is, do not worry about the form of your mentor, okay? That doesn't matter. Look to people who have done what you are interested in, who have a skill or experience that you find relevant to what you want to do, and that's where you focus your attention and energy. I just want to follow up on that question. What was it that made the relationship with these old white men so impactful? What was it that you have gotten out of that relationship that has been so impactful for you? That's really interesting. I think one of the, the, um, 
one of the biggest lessons I have learned from those experiences has been an understanding of how leaders think and how organizations are structured because these are the folks who have been in charge. They've kind of set up the structure. Um, so understanding their thinking and why, you know, why and how they set up their organizational structure matters. Um, and then also kind of being open to suggestions of what to do, even if they didn't seem intuitive to me. Um, you know, one of the best pieces of advice I got from one of these mentors was to put myself out there, like stand in that deeply uncomfortable crowd of, you know, men at the event or the meeting and talk to people. I mean, again, we have perceptions of ourselves. They have perceptions of us. And then we have perceptions of what we think they perceive of us. So it's kind of a three headed, you know, Hydra here to battle, but just constantly remembering that, you know, being told that I have, my work is good. I have merit, I have value, put yourself out there. See that guy over there, see how he's working the room. You work the room, right? Thank you for sharing your experience. I have a two part question. One, how does someone get into foreign affairs? Is there an exam? Is there some kind of on ramp uh, to get into foreign affairs? Also, I have a few students of my intro to social class and we're discussing social status. So how does social status impact access and entry into foreign affairs, if at all? That's a really good question. Um, so I kind of alluded to it a little bit earlier. I did not take the foreign service exam. I went into foreign policy via direct application to a job at the government. Um, I actually started my career, my government career as an honor law graduate. So coming right out of law school, the uh, agencies have this, they have, I think it's still called the um, PMF or the, the Presidential Management Fellow Program. Um, but I did the, the one for law students, which is the honor law program. And I ended up at the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. I knew nothing about nuclear regulation, <laughs> nothing. Um, you know, even getting into nonproliferation, I studied like Dostoevsky and, you know, Russian language. I knew nothing about nonproliferation. What's interesting about international policy, I see kind of like there are two tracks. Um, the one track is, we expect you to come into our world with a degree in international relations, with an internship at this place, with a study abroad. That is not the only way to get in, okay? There are government agencies like Department of Energy, DOD, where all you need is to be interested and have good grades, okay? Um, or to show that you've done some coursework and be able to talk to the coursework that you did. If you did a fellowship like at CSIS, you talk to that. That's really all you need. They do not normally expect you to walk in as an expert. You learn on the job. So, you know, you could go to USA Jobs and just do a search for foreign affairs. Foreign affairs specialist is a job category in the federal government that goes across many agencies. And that's how you could find yourself in there. Think tanks, think tanks are still quite a bubble, you know, getting that on the ground internship or an entry level job is the way to get in with some interest and in some writing in foreign affairs and foreign policy would be helpful. But for me, I'm really happy I went the government route because you get in there, you hit the ground running. They're like, here, learn this, <laughs> do that job. And it's a great way to get your feet wet. And then you can start to learn how to navigate your way through. Um, in terms of you know, perceived, I say it's perceived social class, right? You know, I'm from Queens, you know, Long Island, um, you know, never stop me. You know, I might've thought that I needed to code switch here and there. You know, I think that that idea has softened a little bit 
it's more like here's your professional environment and then here's your fun environment, right? So um, there are women of color who are very, very, very representative of where they come from. Um, you know, one of my closest friends and colleagues is an Afro-Latina and she sits at the head of one of the biggest departments at the State Department. Um, so I would not let any perception about your social class to hold you back at all. Not at all. I mean, if you deal with somebody that has that point of view, right? You're in a, you have a boss that's like that. Here's the other thing I'm gonna say. Don't be afraid to change jobs if the culture of your organization isn't where it should be. It is not your job to change them, okay? So if you go in there and somebody is giving you grief or you feel microaggressions because of your um, anything about you, it is not your job to fix that. Definitely raise the flag, talk to your human resources department or if you have any other resource in the organization and make your concerns known but no job should be at the stake of your sense of um, mental well-being and sense of self-worth. Get another job. <laughs> Thank you so much for, uh, for, for your talk today. I think we all could take something from it. I know I in particular uh, just love this idea of a 22 year old younger mentor. I think uh, not only myself, many of my colleagues could all benefit from that. <laughs> yeah. Um, so my question is, uh, on behalf of those students in the audience who may be intrigued by what you're saying, but are thinking, I don't know if a career in foreign affairs is, is right for me. Is there still some value to seeking an experience abroad and going out into the world in some way, even if you're not going to, to end up being a diplomat or working in a think tank? Oh, I think everybody should study abroad, no matter what uh, field they go into. We are a global community. And, you know, it is important to get out and experience other cultures to learn in different learning environments. Um, you know, it was, again, I told you I'm originally from New York. I mean, I still have friends who have never been to Brooklyn. Uh, you know, just kind of keeping yourself kind of cloistered is not good for any career these days. Any job you go into, they're going to expect you to have some um, soft skills in the area of, you know, being able to navigate different cultures and even different languages. And again, you know, people think of, you know, the traditional study abroad, I apply to a program at Sorbonne and then I go there and I, you know, live with other students and it's really expensive and it's, you know, difficult to get there. That is not the only way to study abroad. Um, you know, the other model is, you know, I'm taking a gap year. This is something that more wealthy kids do. And then they, you know, pack up and backpack across Europe for a year. I did not do that. Um, so there are opportunities. I, I was an au pair. I went as an au pair. I'm the oldest of four kids. I babysat a great babysitting racket when I was in high school because my mom taught kindergarten in town. So, you know, I was able to segue those experiences into being in an au pair, which actually was a homestay with a family. And let me tell you, when you take care of three kids that only speak French and will not do what you say, you learn the language very, very quickly. And the oldest one, um, the, the, the oldest one works for Lehman Brothers and the middle one is a lawyer. That's me. <laughs> <laughs> students feel free i know it's anxiety inducing to stand up in front of the mic but we are getting beat by the number of questions our zoom viewers are asking so if you want to make this a competition feel free but i might throw up um, one more from zoom which is you've sort of as you alluded to gone from law to government to corporate work now to like the nonprofit think tank and in that you know and talking about diversity and inclusion with all of its you know, attending problems have you seen progress or are we just still talking about it and not doing anything generally? Yeah, that, that, that's a great question. That kind of goes to what I teased out a little earlier. Um, government and industry are pretty far ahead um, in terms of what they have done 
to become more diverse and inclusive. I mentioned corporations have done that because they want to make money and they know who their customers are. So, you know, they, they do not care what the talent looks like or where they come from as long as they can do the job. And so, you know, I was at Airbus, which is a European aircraft company with a subsidiary in the United States. And I rose to be chief of staff to the CEO as well as deputy chief administrative officer. And the reason, um, and I've held most of my senior positions have been in aerospace and defense, um, aerospace and defense companies. And again, they are talent driven organizations, not you know, what looks good on paper. State Department, acknowledges, and I will not speak for the State Department, they know they still have an uphill battle when it comes to diversity amongst the federal employee class. You know, obviously the appointments are very diverse, um, you know, in terms of those that are actually Senate confirmed or otherwise appointed by the White House. That class of professionals is very diverse, but the middle is not. And so one of the challenges they have at State Department is accessibility. And one of those accessibility issues have to do with how do they evaluate candidates? Are their internships ever going to be paid? You know, things of that nature where they're putting up these barriers to entry that are still there. In the think tank and, you know, international policy community, those barriers are more subjective. So, you know, these are smaller organizations that tend to um, get talent from those places that they're familiar with. And so really actively working to break down those barriers is what I do in my job um, through the fellowship we have with Trinity, for example, through work that we do on recruiting, retention, standardizing how we do our interviews for hires, making sure everyone's using the same questions for the same candidates, advertising more widely. You know, those are the things that we have to do in the international policy community to continue to improve. It has gotten better, but it's a little slower than what you see, I'd say, in for-profit. Law firms, same thing. You know, they are great with diversity on recruitment, gets a little dicier on the retention side. You don't see as many women or people of color rising to partner. There are a lot of reasons for that. You know, again, job accessibility, not being an impediment to performance is a big issue. You know, perceiving someone as having a family or other thing that would maybe prevent them from working as hard. I think the one silver lining from the pandemic is that now you see that people are very productive working from home and juggling life and family at the same time. So I expect to see a monumental shift in that regard in the next couple of years. Good morning. Good morning. Hey, um, I'm really interested in the book that you're working on. What I'm is, sorry, really interested in what? Uh, I'm really interested in the book that you're working on. Oh, novel. yeah. <laughs> uh, I wanted to know what inspired you to write that and how are you finding time with your busy schedule to, to complete a novel? Oh, gosh, coffee. Um, so that's interesting. That's you know, Everybody had a little pandemic project. That was, that was mine. I never planned to write a book. Um, and, you know, I have this degree in Russian studies, but I also love sp spy novels and, like, the shows the Americans. And um, there were a couple of things that kind of inspired me to write this book. And so I'll just give you the general plot because if I say more, my agent will be mad. But basically it's about a young woman who is a brand new CIA um, agent and she's a Russian speaker, she's African-American. And before she leaves for her assignment, to the Soviet Union, she learns that her parents are not who she thought they were. So when she goes to uh, Moscow, and this is 1991, it's the fall of the Soviet Union, um, she embarks on this journey to not just do her job, but also find her roots. And the parent story takes place um, between 1967 and 1968, right here in Washington, DC. So there's a lot going on. Um, what inspired me to write the book? It's kind of a combination of things. One, um, the movie Forrest Gump, because I was very upset with the way they portrayed the Panthers and counterculture in that movie. That was one. Um, 
The second thing that inspired me was watching the whole series, The Americans, which if no one's seen it, is fascinating. And then third, um, my brother-in-law is a, is a, um, a best-selling author and my dad is a big uh, spy novel fan. And we were watching Hidden Figures. This is the weird thing. And I, we were having a conversation about the racism those women face. And I just happened to mention it was also the height of the Cold War and the space race with the Soviets. And wouldn't it be so easy if the Soviets had decided to target one of those women? And that's how the book happened. Um, so once I had that in my head, I just went and outlined the whole thing. And it's taken me about almost two years to write it. But it's, it's fiction um, and it's a lot of fun because it's historical fiction. But I never, again, I never had the idea to write a book. It just, it happened because of COVID. And I Forrest can. Gump. <laughs> My name is Samuel Ajaka, I'm originally from Ghana. So I just want to ask a question now, in regards to your foreign affairs experience, Supposing while working with the State Department, you realize that um, a policy is being um, brought up, but a policy does not take into consideration the culture of the people or the, the background of the people, uh, the foreign country. How do you help that uh, State Department to mm. reshape in their policy to, so that it will respect all Yeah, countries? that is a good question. Um, one of my characters in my book is um, Ghanaian Russian. That's something to tell you. Um, but at any rate, State Department, it, I would go to their site and ask them. I'm not really sure what the process is. I, I, I can speak from a export control perspective. If you have a green card, you're considered a US person. So you can have access to certain types of information that someone who is not consider a US person um, has access to, but I don't know what their rules are for hiring um, non-US persons at the State Department. I do believe they do offer internships to non-US persons. Um, I think they do, but I'm not sure. So I would check. There are other organizations in, the, in Washington, D.C., though, other than the State Department. The World Bank is an international organization here in Washington, D.C. Think tanks are a great place to go. Um, the UN office that's here is also a good place to go. So as much as I adore and respect my colleagues at the State Department, there are other places where you can take your interests and skills um, in the international policy community. But I would definitely check with them and see what their, their rules are. But I have worked with foreign persons, um, even in the, you know, the, like from the intelligence community that were, you know, working with the US agencies, so it's possible. Well, um, your book talks about the idea that the lack of diversity um, could be detrimental to, the, to our approach towards the world. Oh, I'm so um, sorry. Can you like lean right into the microphone for me? Thanks. Um, I'm, I'm referring to the uh, title of your book. I'm not sure if it's a title or just um, mm -hmm. the statement on it that lack of diversity um, impacts uh, the approach that the US has to the, to the rest of the world. Um, how do you perceive uh, of that diversity? How, how does that diversity look like that would improve the US approach to the world? Yeah, that's, yeah, I wrote a little piece um, not long after the social justice movement in uh, Cuba and my, my, my piece had to do with the fact that the US um, really didn't say much of anything about what was happening. And my theory was because we had put all of our efforts and resources into um, kind of 
Cuban structured society into the white Cuban communities and into the government, we completely ignored the larger population. And when asked what inspired them to push these democratic movements and ideas forward in Cuba, those activists were asked who inspired them, they said Black Lives Matter. So, you know, that is a very recent example of why the lack of diversity in our international policy space leaves us flat-footed in our ability to achieve the goals that we set forth for this country that's so close to us, wanting and stating that we want these things to happen, but when it happens, not really knowing what to do with the people that are making it happen. And so, you know, other areas where it, you know, I, I spoke again to um, Ralph Bunch 70 years ago, brokering that peace between Israel and, and Palestine. You know, why are we back to where we are? Well, you have the same old people having the same old discussions in the same old way. I think there is finally starting to be an understanding of why that's a problem. You know, so the question becomes, do you want to solve the problem or you just, do you want job security? You know, do you need them to keep, you know, enduring so you continually have a problem to solve or do you actually want to achieve something? So, you know, getting not just visual representation, but difference. I mean, looking at, you know, even in like the think tank community, do we recruit outside of DC and New York? Are we getting the perspective from Mississippi? Are we getting the perspective from Nevada, right? Are we getting this perspective from the Caribbean? You know, there are just places where we could really see movement on some of these really vexing issues if we just took a different approach. And having it seen through the lens of somebody different could be, it could be all the difference it could be all, I mean, again, I go back to that meeting I had with those foreign partners where half of them were only concerned about the fact that the brown girl in the room wasn't being talked to and weren't even fully engaged in the meeting. Yeah. Hi, good morning. Oh, actually. Um, so earlier you mentioned the ability to identify people or individuals like yourself and kind of creating a sort of community, but how do you deal with having people that you would consider to be like yourself, but they've kind of assimilated and they don't want to be considered a part of that group. They've kind of disassociated in a way. Um, find somebody else. <laughs> no, I, that's a little bit of a contrite answer. I think there are two ways to answer that question. I mean, on the one hand, you know, what do they say about people? You know, you're liberal when you're young and you become more conservative as you get older. So I think, you know, when I'm talking about lenses and perceptions, you know, before you write them off, kind of take a step back and look at their experience and how they got to where they were and maybe why they are the way that they are, because that might, you might still be able to get something from that, right? Um, so that's one. But again, secondly, just be, you know, there's, there is value in seeing somebody like you in a position that is where you would like to be, it doesn't mean you have to have a relationship with that person. It just means having the visual there sometimes is all that matters. Seeing that you're represented there is all that matters. The other thing is I always tell, um, you know, some of my younger colleagues, you know, just because you see something in the public space doesn't mean you see what's happening in behind closed doors in those meetings. You know, you don't see raised voices. You don't see people, you know, fighting for what they want or what they believe or where they think the organization should go. You know, a lot of the outcome has to do with compromise that, you know, people have kind of battled it out and have compromised coming out. So what you see is not quite what you would expect, but it's a product of the work that was done to get there. Um, 
but you know, don't, don't give up. There's so many great organizations now where you have the opportunity to network with um, other women, with other people of color in foreign affairs and national security. There's women in international security. There's um, WCAPS, Women of Color Advancing Peace and Security. Um, there is the Diversity and National Security Network that we, we partnered, CSIS partnered with last year. So there are other organizations where, again, you don't have to wait to see the one example of you. You can find lots of people like you, and then you can form those relationships as you see fit. But definitely getting into those spaces where you see more people like you, you'll start to build out your, your network and maybe find a mentor that suits your needs. We've got time for maybe one or two more. People, perhaps as we wrap up here, are really interested in you um, on our Zoom chat. Okay, and I will, um, you have my email and I do not mind people reaching out to me on LinkedIn or emailing me. Sure. Um, and if it's a lot of people, I'm more than happy to have another talk. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a, a variation of a couple questions all, all mashed together here. Okay. So, you know, what then led you into Russian studies? And did you find that that got you your first, like sort of helped your early career? We have a lot of students, uh, you know, one of the messages is like what you study in school isn't always correlated to what you end up doing. So what was your experience with what you studied versus when, what you found when you entered the, the terrible term of the real world. Right, no, sure. Well, I knew I wanted to be a lawyer when I was five. So that, you know, mission accomplished. I knew that's what I wanted to do. I was very focused on going to law school from a young age. Um, but in terms of Russian studies, that again was just a result of what was happening at the time. Um, I, you know, again, I grew up in the 70s and 80s. We were bombarded, like Rocky IV came out and Red Dawn, and we were worried about the Soviet menace and Ronald Reagan declared them the evil empire. So there was all this fascination with the region, but at the same time, um, and this could be a research project for anyone, it was also perestroika. So the wall, the Berlin Wall came down when I was a junior in high school and Shortly thereafter, um, Gorbachev, who was premier of the Soviet Union, the last premier of the Soviet Union, um, instituted this program called Perestroika, where they started opening up the country a little bit, and then all these Russians started leaving. And a lot of them, by this time, my family had moved to Northern Ohio, and, and, and all of these Russians were all of a sudden in our school, and I was like, you are nothing like the Wendy's Soviet fashion show commercial, which you should Google. It's your assignment today. Google that commercial and you'll understand that is how we saw the Soviets and Russians at that time. It's horribly funny. Um, and so it just got me to appreciate it a little bit more. And then I took all my French classes in high school and I was able to take Russian my senior year. And that just kind of, I didn't know what else I wanted to do with my life, but I knew I liked Russian language and I knew I liked the the literature and that's what kind of drove me so you know using that as my entry to government again not knowing exactly what I was going to do with it it did help me carry me forward and because of that I got to do the study abroad in Ukraine in law school and I got the job in you know foreign policy with the departments of energy and defense and so you know it definitely went up to a point where my job scope and career got broader than just that region but now, as you can see, I'm right back to it again, you know, part of what's happening with Ukraine, but also, you know, writing this book kind of brings me back to it, so. So earlier you mentioned that there was a big difference between diversity and inclusion. So would you be able to speak more on the inclusion portion of that? statement and for example you mentioned how you would be the only woman of color in those areas so although you got your opportunity to speak to certain people did you feel like your opinions were validated or just as hard as the, as your peers 
Yeah, there's been an interesting phenomenon that's happened in the last 20 years in the working world. It was really highlighted during um, the Obama administration where some uh, senior for national security women uh, started the practice of amplifying. So um, what's, what's happened is that you've seen an increase in um, advocacy, peer advocacy in organizations. So no longer suffering in silence um, but your peers stepping up to advocate on your behalf. Um, and then, you know, using strategies, I found using strategies before I went into the meeting helping. So I would find one or two colleagues who I would say, hey, I'm going to raise this point. Do you mind, like, uh, you know, like when I, when I say it, do you mind doing that? That really helped. But you know, a very common microaggression still in the workplace is that somebody speaks up in a meeting and somebody else either takes their idea or just ignores them. Or later you find out that it happened, but you don't get any credit for it. So you know, again, finding these networks in, the, in your work environment, finding community, creating a system of advocacy, um, is something that I find has gone really, it, it is so common for me now when I have a conversation with one employee about something, two other employees come with them. It is so much more impactful to have that, that community. And I'd say definitely allyship. You don't have to be find an ally that looks like you to be your ally, to speak up on your behalf. And sometimes it's useful to have someone who doesn't look like you speaking up on your behalf as well. So it does take a lot of work. Um, it does take a lot of, again, putting yourself out there, but it is, this is, I think this is really where the world of work is going now. And I'm really happy about it. We've got a few minutes if someone wants the final word and questions. And if not, I'm happy to give you a break. So <laughs> why don't we uh, uh, thank generously uh, Nicole and Dan. Merci. <laughs> Our next panel on global music will start right around 10.30, so stick around. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>